August uh, 2022. I didn't find anybody. Okay, sorry guys. Hey. I have Dr. Hello. Rieger and Dr. Nuzzo here. Hello, hi Dr. Nuzzo. Hi. Nice to meet, nice to meet you, and thank you very much to accept our invitation to the to the Zoom because I think it's very important that you tell uh, parents some answers about the questions of this operation, this payment operation, and uh, as you an inventor of this operation and you are going to retire, I think it's really great to leave such message for the parents and I will spend, uh, sp give this message to everybody, to all the, the platforms and so on. And because parents, they're getting information from the second hand, generally from the other parents. I think it's very important to make just like general Zoom with all the questions. I'm Svetlana, you know me, Dr. Nuza, I'm this crazy French. <laughs> but but I think it's a really good idea to make such kind of Zoom. And I, I really appreciate that you participate. Uh, I prefer that everybody will uh, present themselves first, and then uh, uh, maybe uh, Nancy will ask some questions questions first, and then I will be asking questions from the parents because I have all the list of questions. Ah. So it's for you, Nuzo. If you, if you want... Dr. Nuzo. Dr. Nuzo, if you want to say something for parents. Uh, well, <clears throat> first thing, I, I had announced I was going to retire, and there was such a hubbub. And, <laughs> uh, you can't do that, you can't do that. So I retired from retiring. <laughs> um, but, but the problem was COVID literally destroyed me um, because we couldn't book, our ability to book cases went down because of the way COVID uh, caused so many cancellations. You lose what we call block time, your ability to book far in advance. And then the number of cases I had to do went up and the cases that went up were cases that had gotten worse from lack of treatment. It was just a perfect wave of, and I, so I'm standing here saying, I am completely helpless to do anything about what's coming in. So I said, I might, I might just as well retire. And that's when this guy said, no, you can't do that. Um, you know, he's he's in charge of a large, this is a so very- Can large, you present us the doctor nearby you? As I understand, it's the doctor, doctor who, who is taking- Mark is taking. He was that's He was happy to have me doing all that stuff because he says nine other orthopedic surgeons, pediatric orthopedic surgeons who are doing all of the, you know, the really nasty stuff that orthopedic surgeons have to do. And I was having all the fun taking care of the kids with CP. Uh, but when he heard, I'm leaving, he says, no, no, you can't leave. Uh, and that that was kind of like, all right, I've been trying to find somebody who had an interest in learning this stuff anyway, but it just it just turned out like everybody, you know, people just are into their own thing. And um, so it was very frustrating to me. And then he he came to the rescue. Uh, so can you, I, can, you, can you tell me something? So, so. Can, can you just uh, be presented to the parents because they are searching now the information who will be taking place after Dr. Nuza and who we have to contact? Right. So, so I, actually, it's very simple because Dr. Nuza has a very valuable uh, information and procedures that have helped. I can't tell you how many thousands of kids over the years. And uh, when I heard Roy and I have been friends for many years, when I heard that he was retiring and when we were talking and he said, well, I'm just gonna stop and every, the world's on its own. I said, that can't happen. So I uh, convinced him and his whole team who had made other plans to come out of retirement. So Dr. Nuzo will be with, the, will remain in practice for another few years. And during that time, you know, I have over 30 uh, plus years of experience in surgery and dealing with the, all various components, but really we were taking over the practice and a lot of the things I understand that he can do, the technical component is very simple to do, uh, you know, from just from a surgical standpoint, but the understanding. So there'll be that transition where Dr. Nuzo and I will be working as a team. He usually would have somebody who assist on an irregular basis. I'll be assisting him and working as co-surgeons on a regular basis. And then um, when uh, I let him, Dr. Nuzo will uh, be able to finally retire and enjoy life. Uh, but I think he enjoys doing this. And uh, we have the opportunity now to continue this. So the practice is still going to be very viable. Uh, Dr. Nuzo is going to be a component. Instead of having just random uh, co-surgeons, he's going to have me on a constant basis. 
And then once uh, everybody's comfortable with the transition and the world sees that everything's good, then I'll let Roy uh, retire knowing that his uh, expertise and his knowledge can continue on. And uh, because I'm in a little bit of a larger group, I actually train other individuals so it will not be lost. So from your part, what I will be waiting a lot, it's a contact information for the parents because right. it will be still in New Jersey. Right. Well, here's here's the thing. Um, I, I limited my practice to, to neurologic disorders early on because there's so much of it. And it just, I couldn't be doing six things at once. So Mark was doing stuff I would never dream of doing. And I was doing stuff that, you know, he's glad, glad that I'm doing it because it takes up so much of your time. Uh, so it was an efficient separation, but with me leaving, it was it was going to leave a big imbalance, big big vacuum. So the doing of the SPML is actually simpler than the not doing of SPML. I mean, technically, with what you have to hands on do, if you don't learn SPML, you're working way harder than you have to work. But uh, the thing about SPML, it's in the knowing, and I and and everybody wants to know what is the SPML operation, and the fact is there isn't an, an SPML operation. I don't think. How many times have you, have you done? Have you done the same thing twice yet? No, I mean it's a technique, <laughs> but I, I think this question that you're asking is nothing changed. The contact remains the same, and everything remains the same. It's in New Jersey. We still work out of Overlook. Uh, the uh, one of the offices has shifted a little bit, but still in New Jersey. Right. And in order to contact Dr. Nuzo, it's been a seamless transition. So we try to make it very easy for people to try to find Dr. Nuzo to uh, just use the same websites and the same emails and the same numbers to contact so nothing's changed Great. and you'll still get rob and enza uh, because uh I, I not only convinced dr nuzo to stay but uh, i kept them in as a team so it should be fairly uh transparent to the you know or we won't really see anything changing. So just continue to contact the organization. Great. The let's let's then 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 talk with a, a little bit with with Nancy because Nancy he, she's also near by you. If the parents need help also after operation, they can contact her. But first of all, I think the most important question because we will have parents who even don't know what is it SPML. So the first question, if you can explain quickly just simply for the parents, because they are not doctors. What is SPML? What is the difference SPML like operation? What kind of operation SPML? Well, you have to start with what is not SPML first, because it's it's that is what is making all the confusion. The confusion is not coming from SPML. It's coming from what was before. Uh, they're calling it cerebral palsy. And in a lot of these kids, the problem that you're actually seeing, the thing that you want fixed, isn't cerebral and it isn't a palsy. So right off the bat, you're, you're, you're coming in with questions about the cerebral palsy, when in fact, the, the problem that the kids are having with disability is not from their contractors. They have contractors. So he can fix that in a, minute, in a heartbeat. I can fix that in a heartbeat. Contractors are easy stuff to an orthopedic surgeon. That's like uh, eating spaghetti to an Italian. You know, it's not hard to do. <laughs> Fractures is easy stuff. The problem is coordination, timing, independence, conservation of energy. So the disability is not related to the contractors even a little bit. The contractors are related to the energy loss in trying to do the functional things that they can do. Okay. So these kids have found a second ways of getting things done and they're energy inefficient. All right. So our job is to say, well, can we get the efficiency back? Well, it turned out and it was a little bit of a surprise, I'll tell you. I'd, I'd like to tell you that I thought of this in the beginning. I didn't. Um, but you start to notice things along the way that when you do a simple operation that's so simple, so that was easy. I mean, not five minutes. And, and, and you see this enormous jump in function. And the kids are doing things with, with skill. I didn't give them that skill in that amount of time. I didn't spend, I mean, if I was teaching a kid clarinet, it would take years of teaching all the notes. You know, here are the kids, they're, they're playing their legs like they're playing a clarinet professionally. And, and, and it happened in a, in a very short order. So where did all that skill come from? Well, it came from you guys, therapists, but, it, but, it, but you were unlocking something that was already there. So we're seeing kids who had skills that you couldn't see before. And I was calling it Michael Jordan in a garbage can. Uh, you know, how, you know if, if you got to judge Michael Jordan seeing him stuffed into a garbage can, would you know you had a great basketball player on your hands? And the answer is no, you wouldn't. Um, so we, we, we are grossly underestimating the skill level 
that's still in the nervous system that hasn't been tapped into because the tapping into it costs so much energy that it's just exhausting. So the original SP Mills, when they got started, or got started, it was for cardiac kids. These are all kids who had cardiac anomalies who could not produce the energy level required. Uh, and their, their cerebral palsy was secondary to the cardiac effect. So, so there we were forced to come up with a way of having them not die of heart failure. That's what our treatment was actually about. These were kids who were, <clears throat> they call them blue babies. They turn blue if they try the simplest thing and they squat on the floor. Um, so the, so I couldn't operate them under general anesthesia because they couldn't have general anesthesia. They could only have local. So, and, and they were on anticoagulant. So I couldn't make big incisions because they'd bleed all over the place. So we had to put in small amounts of anticoagulant with the local anesthetic. So, so it, it was by definition going to be something very small, trying to take down the energy cost of, of what these kids were experiencing. And then surprise, surprise, these kids start running circles around our other cerebral palsy kids. And that's when it suddenly said, okay, we've got to study this a little closer. Something happened. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't make all that good stuff that I'm looking at. Uh, I, I did a little bit here and a little bit here and this kid's running around like there's nothing wrong with him. Um, it's, and, uh, and it doesn't take you too long after you see a couple, like uh, the, the six-year-old kid who, who I said one pop, uh, we just did one little poke to one leg and one little poke to the other leg. And there's a kid who had never walked. Uh, he had all kinds of theory up to the age of six. And that week he's running all around the town. So uh, that that is a- that's, that's, that's exactly what the parents wants to, wants to hear. And maybe, maybe Nancy, if you can to explain more simply words for the parents, because it was complicated, Dr. Well, Luzi, for imagine, the parents. Imagine you're carrying cinder blocks right. and I take the cinder blocks away. That's what it looks like. Right, but but to put it a little bit simpler, think of it this way. What what Dr. Nuzo learned was instead of one signal coming in and hearing one note, the children were hearing many notes because that's what the brain was doing. And the SPML, without getting into the comp the, the details, it allows the body to send less signals down. So less instead signal. of the children using lots of energy trying to get rid of all these other signals making it difficult to walk, SPML through a very simple technique gets rid of the fibers that produce all these extra notes. So think like if the brain was trying to listen to a concert but just listen to a violin, it, you, you'd want to quiet all the other instruments so you can hear that. That's what SPM does. Uh, does. So that's why the energy becomes more efficient because now the child can concentrate in a very simple way without having all these excessive signals. And it prevents a lot of the contractures associated with this and secondary adaptive procedures. I hope that was simple. And, what you and this, this SPML operation, we, we agree that it's work on what part of the body? Generally, it's work on the fascia and for the tendons and, uh, and just- that, actually, That's okay. a little bit misleading. Um, the problem was I never named this operation. We called it perks in the beginning because that's the operating room simply need to know that they need a big table full of orthopedic equipment or one little pan that we use with our tiny little lifting. Uh, so we just say perks and that, that that was, but the problem was other things came along like percutaneous gallbladder surgery. And you know we, we did this back in the day when there was no such thing as, as minimally invasive surgery. This was the first minimally invasive surgery ever. So, um, so the, 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 the name was given by, by two physiologists from Johns Hopkins and they gave it a name that's twice as long as SPML. I couldn't even say it myself. I have to think about it now. But she's asking where it is. So, the, but the, what I'm saying, the name, the name, the they named it from the fascia because when I was explaining it to them, these fibers that we're seeing, which I think are simply denervated uh, motor elements, run the whole distance. They run from one joint to the other joint. But, but as they pass through the myofascia, now they're in a they're in a flat plane like a piece of paper where you can find them easier. So it's not that we're out to to lengthen the fascia. We're not. We're out to lengthen the contractures that are easily to easily found and isolated as they pass through the myofascia. So what happens is where the muscle becomes a little bit thicker, there are nerve fibers there that we're able to identify and cut. And by cutting those percutaneously, that means a little poke, it then cuts out all the other information that is extraneous that the body shouldn't be getting. So it cuts out the noise. So what the misconception sometimes is when they say you're cutting the tendon, these nerves are near a part of the tendon that 
that is important that has nerve fibers, but the point of the procedure is to actually cut the nerve fibers, which are sending the abnormal signals. So that's why it, it's really not a tendon lengthening procedure, which classic CP does, where we open it up and lengthen the tendons. It's almost inadvertently when you're lengthening the tendons, you're doing what we're doing simply without actually lengthening the tendons, for, uh, severing those nerves that are actually hyperactive. Does that answer the question? I think that hopefully is simple. Yes, enough. it's it's answer the question. But when, for example, for these techniques, you decide to use um, ethanol blocks and when not to use, because ah, for okay. some children you used ethanol blocks and for some not, and ethanol blocks doing the same thing. In fact, it's it's making this noise lower for a child, then he can move better. Okay, in engineering, this is called low pass filter. Uh, it's the same thing as a Dolby on your uh, stereo. What happens is uh, when these nerves are, are, are stimulated too high, they produce a, a burst of signals rather than one signal. You're only supposed to have one signal per, per information. Okay. Instead of getting one signal, say, ah, this happened. It's, it's coming out as a stutter. Now that, that stutter gets to the other end. And every time it hits the end, it dumps acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter, onto the next guy. So the next guy is getting drowned in uh, in, uh, a in a lot of signals, and the signals go all over the place, and it can no longer distinguish <clears throat> good signals from bad signals, on from off. So so what we're calling that we call that noise. When you have extra signal, too many signals, that's called noise. It's, you can call it an echo if you like, but it's noise. Well, all you want is what the one signal has to say, and that's it. So what do you do? The 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 nerves that carry that that signal are wrapped with a with a special kind of fat called myelin, okay? <coughs> and the end result is that nerve travel uh, conducts that signal 15 times faster than any other nerve in the body. It's a high speed freeway and it's yes. meant for speed. But if you put just a one little section in there where, where you can just break up the myelin, okay? When it hits that spot, that thing slows down and all the other ones pile into it. Now the amplitude is determined only by the geometry of the nerve. So the amplitude never gets bigger or smaller. So when these things pile into it, you have 15 signals come out as one. I see. So, I see. so it was supposed to be one signal. It was 15, hits this bump, comes out as one. So yeah. it's correcting the signal. So it's a two 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 tier effect. So the when you do the SPML, you're cutting some of the signals At coming. The source. And then some of the, you're still left with some excessive signals. And what the alcohol does is demyelinate, remove some of the myelin. So now you have a lower amount, a smaller number of extra signals, but now you're even able to lower it even more with the alcohol. And that becomes a clinical judgment on how much you want to dampen the signal, whether it's just going to be with the SPML or whether you want to supplement it with the alcohol. And we test this. Uh, all these original cardiac kids were done with no general anesthesia at all. They were done our 100% local. Now we try to duplicate that on these other kids. CP kids will never hold still for that. So we, we put them to sleep to get the local in, and then we bring them up high until they're reactive. Once they're reactive, then we start to do what we're doing because it's more like tuning a piano. We're looking right. for a, a level of reaction that's consistent right. with high level of function. We're trying to like match needles in a camera. You want you want the amount you want the amount of reactivity that that reflects the amount of doing. Not, yeah. not, that that's that's an interesting point though because that's the paradox of SPML. It looks very simple uh, because it's very small incision and it's very quick, but it, it's the understanding of how much of that signal you want to decrease that's very, very important. So that's the art of the medicine. Um, and so that was a great question about the alcohol because they each have a dampening effect, the SPM and the alcohol and understanding how much you want to get so the child walks properly is very important. I see. And uh... For example, if we can compare, because it's one of the questions parents asking every time, a lot of times in the group, they really it's really difficult for the parents to understand the difference between SPML and PERX. I think it's historically mm -hmm. happened. But can you explain it simply what the difference between SPML and PERX? For me, SPML is less invasive than PERX. Uh, yes, in the initial, well, hold on. The very first perks were simply the cardiac kids. You couldn't get less than that because we were 
you have no idea. I was scared to death. I, I've done some very big surgery in my life, and I was a Navy trauma surgeon, so you can imagine. Okay, nothing scared me more than the perks because we had cardiac kids, and it wouldn't take much to to, to kill a kid like that. So we were being really careful. So when people talk about our low complication rate, that's not by accident. That was by design. We started out with a, with a crazy level of caution uh, and then built up. But then other people called things perks. And then so, that's where the, 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 the people from Johns Hopkins saying it's getting confusing because you're calling it perks. It's little. They're calling it perks. It's big. Uh, and, and I said, oh, yeah, well, I, I was experiencing the same thing. So I went with their name. They named it. Uh, they named it. Uh, Selective heart disease, myofascial lengthening, with extra words after that. Uh, I said, "Okay, that, I'll take that name." I never named it, but, but it, it's. I, I, we should probably call it Mark's Mark's operation now or no, something. No. So, so I, let, let me, anything you want to call it, but it, but just know that it's it's not it's not an operation where you cut from here to there, go a certain depth, sew something together, and you get out. It's not that. Just, just, yeah, just from a classic orthopedic understanding, anytime you just make a small incision, it's percutaneous. But what, what the distinction between SPML and a and a lengthening, you can do them both percutaneously. But when you're classically talking about a percutaneous lengthening, you're actually going ahead and putting the blade inside and cutting and separating a tendon I see. to connect that tendon. That's different than SPML, where you're looking at for a selective portion of the tendon and trying to simply cut the nerve fiber component. So you don't have to cut the whole muscle or, or cut the whole tendon. You just have to eliminate the nerve fibers. So percutaneous is a gestalt, you know, general thing that once you put the knife in, it's then what you do with the knife. So traditionally, the percutaneous lengthening is you cut the tendon and make it longer. That's what you're doing. With SPML, you're going in and you're simply finding the part of the tendon where the nerve fibers are and cutting that part of the tendon. And you may not get a total lengthening of the muscle, to be quite frank. And that's I, not what we're looking for. We just want to do e Excellent explanation. Excellent. This is re really good explanation. It's explained a lot. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, Nancy, you, can, you saw a lot of children <laughs> after SPML. Generally, how much time it takes to recover after SPLM if we compare to the traditional lengthening? It will be a really good comparison. Yeah. Uh, well, so, typically uh, our kids are up up the same night as the surgery, walking around. They may hurt a little bit. It varies. Don't forget, some of our kids, you have to be careful because some of the kids who are the best at getting up and running around are the kids who have sensory disorders. They don't feel pain. Uh, but I'm saying for the kids who do feel pain, they're usually sore for a few days. I mean, if you poke somebody with a sharp object, you're going to feel something for at least three, four days and typically yeah. not past five. Right. But I think the, 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 the big distinction is when you do an SPML, like we were discussing, you're not disconnecting the whole muscle. You're just disconnecting part of the tendon. So you have function of the muscle. When you're doing a classic percutaneous lengthening of a tendon, or, or you're actually disconnecting the muscle to the tendon. And so it has to be relearned, or at least the muscle has to reattach to a certain degree to start functioning again. So the recovery from an SPML is a lot quicker because what you're recovering from an SPML really is you're retraining the brain how to use the muscles correctly now that they're able to do that. When you do a muscle lengthening, you're actually allowing the muscles to heal and trying to use the muscles in a different functioning way, but not necessarily have changed the signal that has been going to the muscles. That's why sometimes when you do classic CP surgery, you're doing larger procedures and even doing bony procedures, which are generally not 100%, but generally avoid it with uh, this type of surgery. Yeah, prevention. Surgery. Can I put one other thing out? And this is so obvious, but nobody ever talks about it. Okay, the mother's pelvis only is only so big. Yeah. Okay, you can't get a full-size brain through it. No. Okay, so children are born with only half their nervous system. So when they have damage to their nervous system, there's another half that hasn't even been built yet. That's going to be built on existing patterns of use. Yep. So we want those existing patterns of use to be age appropriate. I want an eight month old doing what eight month olds do. I want a one year old doing what one year olds do. I want a four year old doing what four year olds do. So we try to keep them age appropriate because they're building a nervous system on that. If they don't have that, then they don't build it on that. So, so the uh, ability to look better in the future is also coming from the fact 
that were giving them uh, 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 something to, to root uh, new new growth into that's that's healthy. <clears throat> it's you know we're giving them healthy we, movement early, not waiting for hips to dislocate. Because I this this thing that drives me absolutely crazy is that they say early detection with hip, with hip X-rays. That's not early. If you see bone damage on a hip X-ray, yes, if already you see bone damage, early. it's too late for a stem cell infection. Yeah, you've got you've got substantial cartilage damage by then. So what we're saying is, if you see a kid's legs are, are crossed and going like that in the hips, that's like some, seeing somebody strangling somebody. Uh, you don't have to wait for the person to pass out to say, "Well, that's not a good idea. Take your hands off." You know, if the legs are going like that in the hips, hips are being damaged. By the time the X-ray shows that, you've got a lot of existing damage. So what we're saying is. Uh, don't allow damaging things to exist. Just don't allow it. And 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 if it's now, if that was hard to, you know, if that took you know lightning bolts from the sky, then maybe you're stuck. But it turns out a couple of little pinholes in, in and out, and you know, out you go. And we can get rid of that. We so we don't we don't see uh, hip dysplasia and hip dislocations in the kids that were treated young. And by young, I mean one year of age. What year? One year of age. Even the one year of age, the only thing we need is the alcohol. And uh, uh, right. and, and then they get the kids who are two or three, and then now, now by now they got some real contracture going on. So we'll take down little teeny bits of contracture. Now we may they're going to have a lot of growth ahead of them, so maybe they they have to be done a second time. But the bottom line is we're not we're not seeing any hips that need VROs or hip thing or any slobs or you name it. My whole life has been the avoidance of VROs because their their complications are so high, <laughs> and the results are so right. awful. Um, I just you know so the idea is part of this is avoidance. We're trying to avoid what we know will happen if done badly. Uh, and so we're being pushed into do bigger things when we see trouble coming. So it isn't just SPMLs. When you see the hip going bad, then we have our slob to try to protect the hips. Right, but but the point that's a very important point to understand is trying to do it early. What, what we're trying to do through the technique is bones and joints develop normally when they have normal signals. They develop abnormal, with abnormal signals. So getting back to the same concept, the beginning concept of SPML, we're trying to eliminate all the extra signals. So you end up with the signals that you have that are what you're supposed to have. So if you have the normal signal coming and you create that normal signal uh, earlier in life and develop normal walking patterns because you've taken care of these children earlier, then it, it makes sense from a logical standpoint that bones will develop normally and the muscle will develop normally. And then you're in what we call a positive spiral that you now have the normal signals going, normal bony development, and then you keep doing that. I understand, but then I have another logical question because we know that sometimes children, they need the second STML because we have a growth spruits. Right. Boys. Well, boys mainly boys. boys. Yes, but I have a boy. <laughs> And I know. So well, they what, grow till they're well, eighteen or nineteen years old. It's a hard time to be good, and people have they lapse. You know, they eh, it's summertime. Oh, who wants to work brace? You know, they, they go through these periods where they lose ground, and then they have a big growth spurt when they're when they're at the hardest to tell them what to do phase. You know, right. uh, so, and then when they when they realize they've lost some function, they come back. But the, we do what we call a touch up. It's it's right. not as big as the first SPML. We're just take, taking out some of the contracture there that is that's come from growth. It, well, uh, it, that has to do with physiology too. Yeah. So all all children, when they grow, bones get longer first, then muscles catch, muscles up. catch up. And for whatever reason, children who have slightly increased tone when their bones grow, the muscles sometimes lag a little bit. That's why when people look at us and say, "Well, you know, my child is walking wonderful. Why do why do you want to still keep him in the nighttime brace?" Is because during that nighttime, uh, I'm sorry, during that growth spurt, it's been shown that if you can would be proactive and stretch the muscles, the sarcomeres or the, the, the little units that make up muscles will actually respond quicker to the growth spurts and grow quicker. So you don't get those tight muscles in the first place. So it's an, pretty much the old expression, the ounce of prevention is worth a pound to cure. That if you keep stretching the muscles with the bracing at night, you can avoid some of those uh, need for the follow-up. Yes, so. if, if it works, because for example, in our in our case, we have a dystonia, secondary dystonia, and it's rejected all the braces, like no braces. Dystonia and braces don't go together. Just no question about it. I've, I've seen people who have, where police have come to a person's house because they thought they were murdering somebody, and it's just a kid being told to wear his brace. So, um, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to deal with uh, dystonia braces. And unfortunately, this is where I have a real problem now. 
there was a guy who could treat the stony and make it go away, but he died. And we took it with him. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's yeah. kind of, you know, he had, a, uh, he was operating on the brain awake. Yeah, you have to look at the stonia is really more. It's happening. Brain. It's really and happening. Spasticity here. is the end result near the muscles. It's happening down to the end. And so yeah. sometimes that we have to be very careful, careful of. We just had a patient we saw this morning that when you relax the spasticity, then sometimes it's masking the impact of the dystonia, dystonia. and you have to be careful because dystonic patients, and you can have a mixture of different, you know, you don't always have to have pure dystonia, pure spasticity, usually nomination. But if you have the dystonia component, that that has another set of issues that we have to be a little bit more cautious of. And they do have a little bit higher failure rate because they, they do not tolerate bracing like a true spastic child will. Uh, yes, that's exactly what we saw with Dr. Nuzo with my child because he's majority dystonia. And, and they uh, kind of warned about it. I remember, I actually said it. But he's, he's doing really perfect after yeah. operation. I am very happy with it. But dystonia, I saw about braces yeah, saw. and it was not. Right, but that, that gets into the point that's very important that you ha as long as you recognize it, you recognize. can deal with it appropriately. Like, and, and I don't know your child specifically, Dr. News, but we, we've seen kids since I've started working at News. So as long as you recognize the issue, you can deal with the, the, the problems and prevent. But what issues. is interesting that, that this operation, it's uh, SPMN works also for dystonia. At any case, it works for my child, it works for spasticity now. and for dystonia, and it's open a new question because parents asked uh, SPML we have to do after is there or before is there or instead of there because the we choice. have another operation there's a third choice before I was doing SPML before I was calling it perks we were doing the alcohol blocks now when we were doing the alcohol blocks in the early days how did you do an alcohol block you made an incision found the nerve and then dripped ethanol on it with an eyedropper okay it was done open then we had a we had to get an engineer involved to come into the operating room with us and say, okay, that nerve gives off a signal. Can't we find that signal? And he says, yeah, sure. So next thing you know, we had a, you know, the, the, the same needle that they use for doing some clavian sticks, which is a needle inside of a plastic thing. We were using that as a cover on the needle, as an aerial, to, uh, as a detection aerial to see if we could find the nerve. So on one side, we're doing it open. The other side, we're, we're seeing if we can't locate the nerve by its signal. And then that evolved very quickly to say, okay, we can also inject through it. We can do the alcohol right through the same nerve, right through the same needle that we're doing the signal with. That's how that evolved. And we were doing that for the very bad dystonia kids. So the, the, the treatment of dystonia with alcohol blocks came first. Yes. So, and then and the SPML kind of engulfed it. And after, uh, even if the child had SDR before, uh, oh. See the SDR. Here's the problem: uh, there's signal coming down. The, the, the kid, the, the kid doing funny looking things, and you think in his brain there's funny looking things, but that's not what's happening. In the brain, the correct thing to do is there. He's sending it down, but the signal's getting getting garbaged on the way. Okay, mm. uh, but a dystonic signal, which is a bad signal, saying go only go this way, you know, only only point to the left, is coming down. It's getting garbaged, so you don't see it. So the dystonia. Is is in in fact being disrupted by the noise. Spasticity yeah. is is uh, the what you want to do. The good thing to do is getting disrupted by the noise. But the bad thing that the Stony wants to do is being somewhat disrupted by the noise. You take the noise away, and now the kid can do all these good things. And then on top of it, there's this dystonic second piece. He he mo he moves his foot this way, and then the arm goes this way. You know, yeah. um, that yeah, but that's the point. That's the but yeah, no, point she... as far as SD... Oh, I'm sorry. Can I just... No, she wanted SDR to say before something. Before or after... May, may I comment on the SDR before or after? SBML? So... Yes. The question of the parents, if they have to do as they are before or after or right. instead. So the answer is it'd be better, and not, this is not a bias, it's just been shown, that it'd be better to do the SPML before and then see how the child does, and then see if they even need SDR. The issue that we have with SDR is even though it will decrease spasticity to a great degree, there's no question about it, it also has a sensory uh, input issue where you do get some issues with decreased sensation. So when the child walks, they sometimes are a little bit hesitant 
Think about it, if your foot's a little bit numb and you're walking, you can do that, but you're a little bit more cautious. You don't get that with SPML, okay? And then the other thing with SPML is you generally don't have the hip issues, whereas if you have a slight a dystonic, uh, dystonic component and you haven't recognized that and you do SDR, you sometimes get hip dysplasia where the hips start coming out, which is exactly the opposite effect you get with SPML where you actually protect the hips. So our, our thought is, and we're looking into potentially doing a project on this, but it's it's, it's quite difficult with the energy, it's very laborious to try to get this project. But we believe that the patients that we've seen with SPML really can avoid SDR. And then the one, ch the children who may still have a little bit of hypertonia afterwards, they may be the good candidates for the uh, SDR to, to sort of quiet it down. It's almost sort of like we do SPML, then we have the alcohol because we need a little bit more. And the, the algorithm we would use is SPML. Then if we need a little bit more alcohol, then if we need a little bit more, then consider the SDR. And it's a much quicker procedure, a much safer procedure. And it avoids uh, exposure of the spine with all the potential complications and the intense rehab after it. But that, that that's, I think, uh, addresses your question, I hope. Uh, Thanks, yes, for, it's exactly. Uh, yeah, four SPMLs doesn't equal one of any of those other things. And, and even if you do SPML, and you do require a touch up and get a great result. Two two small SPMLs are are much much less surgery than one SDR. You you do more going to the dentist for dental care. So, I understand. Uh, I think Nancy wanted to say something. Wanted me, we cut it here. No. 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 Thank you. Well, I, I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about the SDR SPMLs. Whether you think. Um. So. Um, I've had a few children who did SDR. One of them specifically first did SPML. The child was very young. Um, and then a few months later did SDR because they didn't think it was enough, which made me completely crazy. Um, the child is now still walking with a walker, which for me is fine. Um, but I think sometimes the, the desire for the parent to have the child up and walking becomes so tremendously disabling for the child because you have to give the child time to learn and to grow and to have transitions. And I think, you know, 22 years ago, I met Dr. Nuzzo through Dr. Jordan and I sent a patient who I had worked with doing Feldenkrais and a and and not ABM yet, but a little bit of a, a not Bunyell method, but physical therapy. And he was hemiplegic slightly. And Dr. Jordan said, you can't just do an AFO, you must have SPML. And the mother didn't want to do surgery. And I said, I, I, I trust these people, I think I would, I would try this. And it was literally a poke in the ankle. And this child is now ice skating. He's perfect. He is 100%. And so that was the first child I sent to Dr. Nuzzo. And I have sent hundreds and every single child that I have with who has any kind of scissoring or feet pointing um, or hamstring tightness or cross extension reflexes, I send to Dr. Nuzzo because the change is immediate. And um, with SDR, I, I was out in in Missouri, I went to the clinic. I, I was watching the, the therapy afterwards. Um, there were some, you know, SDR can be also miraculous, but it's a very, very long rehab. And it's, uh, it, there's also a lot of risk involved because you're opening up the spine. Um, and you do lose, as the doctors were saying, so much sensory input. So I always feel, and, and I always tell parents, even if you have to do SPML twice, it's for me as a, because I've been in the procedure a few times, Dr. Nuzzo was gracious enough to allow me to be there. It's almost like glorified Botox without the poison. I mean, it's so simple and it's so, it, it almost shouldn't be called either a procedure or a surgery because it's just this thing you could almost just do in the office. So I just feel like, what's the big deal? And even if you do it twice, your child has all this mobility that they didn't have. Um, so it's, it's really important to 
for parents to know that there is there is just nothing to worry about. There is really almost no risk. As Dr. Nuzzo once said to one of my 15 month old fathers, pa patient, the father of a 15 month old, the father said, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? And Dr. Nuzzo said, the light could fall on him during the procedure and crash. <laughs> so I, I have to say, I sort of agree with that because it is very, and, 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 it, and it is like playing a guitar. Dr. Kanalopoulos, who went a few years ago in Greece, said it's like being a great cellist or violinist. You, you're feeling, you need to know how to feel. And, and all I can say is that having been a PT for 35 years and working with kids all these years, I am appalled that all of these orthopedic surgeons at HSS and Columbia and at NYU, except for Dr. Price, who thankfully is doing it, are not doing SPML. It's it's a shame, is all I have to say. Because so if I could just, yeah, go ahead, please finish. No, that's it. No, you know, it reminds me, you remind me of the story of Dr. Ponsetti for 50 years with club feet. You know, everybody operated on club feet until finally there was an advocate, which hopefully will end up being me, that uh, promoted Ponsetti technique, which is an operative technique for club feet. And the next thing you know, the world knows Ponsetti technique has the the treatment and nobody operates on them anymore. And everybody says, I can't believe I operated on so many feet, including myself, by the way. That's why I was so open when the boy, uh, Dr. Nuzzo had this technique to, 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 to think about what he was doing. But but with the Ponsetti, I thought that they were doing just a little release in the Achilles. If yeah, it yes, no, no, they, we do a perc that's a true percutaneous Achilles tendon. I think where we cut the tendon, but my point is we used to do a huge posterior medial lateral release where the patients were in the hospital. I mean, it, the foot was stiff and looked good, but it was stiff as a board. And, and, you know, if you looked at a picture, it looked great, but we asked the function, it was terrible. Now we have kids and I've been doing that for 15 years now that they run around like you'd never know anything was wrong with their feet. And that's with the SPML. And it, you know, just because you're, and, and I don't want to slam my colleagues in, in these great institutions because they do great work, but sometimes that's the way I was taught and that's the way I do it. And sometimes you have to realize that, you know, you like Dr. Hall would always espouse that sometimes you have to look at alternative treatments and, and maybe there is a better way and at least explore it. So I applaud you for, 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 for saying oh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we are really happy with this panel we, we did uh, with Dr. Nusa. And I think my child, it's more complicated because it's, dystonic child. We never had as there at any case he has secondary dystonia. He's not even real cerebral palsy child because he had cardiac arrest at age of four years old. It's not real cerebral palsy. It's more like uh, like uh, like stroke uh, during the age but but at any case SPLM worked just perfectly and the most difficult is to explain to the French doctors and so on what is it exactly and doctors not always understand exactly what is it that's why i'm really happy to to make this zoom because i also will send it to the doctors you know dr news the doctors we have two doctors here in france to send <laughs> uh, they've, actually they've been sending me emails yes uh, i'm trying to help them as best they can because the single biggest problem when you're dealing with a surgeon who's learned surgery and has surgical textbooks you, know, you turn to a certain page and there's the operations you do for the thing. Uh, is that you know you cut from A to B and you go to certain depth and make a thing so wide and use this kind of suture and sew it to that other thing. It's a series of steps that you do <clears throat> with uh, with SPML. First thing we do is assess. We're we're actually we're moving the legs and and the other thing is uh, the idea that we're um, that we're 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 actually doing these these divisions that you're talking about while the leg is moving. That's why it takes two people to do this operation. It's always taking two people. Uh, the podiatrist used to be take used to be taking turns because they'd love to watch, so they'd be the one doing the moving, and uh, so because we're trying to judge what is the what is the tension like for swing phase of walking, what is the what is the tension like for landing, so we're we're, we're trying to reproduce walking, uh, so we need the patient as light as possible. Anesthesiologist gets them just as light as they can, so they don't just crawl off the table, but. Uh, uh, and uh, and with the local anesthetic, we're 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 getting the uh, final right and left tensions, front and back tensions, so that they match function. Uh, and then going after the recept 
The first step is go after all these receptors that are screaming bloody murder, uh, bloody, <laughs> bloody murder. Bloody murder. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, and that, and 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 sometimes, for example, there'll be abduction. The abduction range is normal, but when we do the abduction, the other leg responds. There's a little central slip that we'll go after. That before and after we do this operation, the abduction and abduction hasn't changed at all, but the reaction has. So so um, it's an the idea that we're uh, that you're operating for reactivity levels that you have to feel. Yeah. And uh, but so. So That's why, but but the parents, what they will be looking, it's the contact of all the doctors you are teaching. As you said me last mail that you are teaching nine doctors. I really want to have all contacts for the parents. Even yes, yes, one doctor, and I know that you teach also Doctor Kanelopoulos in Greece. I yeah, already yeah. contacted him. I already talked to him, and uh, so. But we need to know all the doctors who is doing real SP SPML. And well, we're, 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 uh, why, we're stepping through his group one at a time. So I, right now, I, I'm the one who's uh, working with Dr. Nuzo and, and working at the whole system to make sure it's smoothest to, uh, to everybody who's coming on board and getting consistency. And then uh, that's why we're keeping Dr. Nuzo on. So as you know, each one of us get proficient at that, then we will let Dr. Nuzo enjoy his retirement sometime in the year. Distance. If if doctors will be not only in New Jersey but in other parts of United well, States, please please give us information, and we just give all this information to parents because we have our big uh, Facebook page for the parents who are interested, and not only Facebook page, also on Instagram. As you know, you have parents coming even from other countries, from Romania, from Russia, from from Japan, and so on. So we need to go to, to give information internationally, and it's the purpose of this discussion because parents, they are searching this information, and it's very difficult to get it. Right. Well, to, to answer that question, right now it's here, and then we are looking at, uh, because it's a new relationship, but we are looking at other avenues to try to disseminate it. I would like to be uh, Dr. Nuzo's disciple. Dr. Nuzo developed it, but I'd like to be the uh, disciple that uh, gets it out to the to the world, to, because I it just, uh, you know, when you look at some of the videos before and after, you like, let's say, come on, that's... You know that 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 what do you call it with the AI? Uh, you know that was AI produced. So like no, these are like kids having normal lives. It's it's really quite amazing. It's really quite amazing. I so agree. we we are working. I, you have my word. We're working on trying to uh, make it much much more uh, disseminated throughout the, not just the United States but the world because it's a lot of kids that that uh, have really changed lives from this technique. Um, and you guys can reach out to me anytime with whatever you need. Yes, of course. And uh, of course, I can reach you and I also can maybe give your mail, uh, Roy, Rob. Anytime. Parents, in, in case if they, because sometimes Dr. Nuzen now, he has no time to answer parents when they want to send the, the child, for example, for the video of the child, if he is a candidate, maybe we can give your mail to, to send for, for the for. Uh, I, I hit my mail three candidate. times a day. No, no, you know, Dr. Nuzo usually answers every day and if not, I then... Know. We made available, but if for whatever reason it's not getting through, you can always. Rob's always the uh, anchor to the organization to make things happen. So if you, right. if you can't get one of us, you'll always get a hold of Rob, and Rob, believe me, can find us anywhere. Uh, if I anywhere. can make a plea, <laughs> if I can make a plea, simple plea, please. Uh, I lose an enormous amount of time in email when people don't include a first name and a last name of the patient. Uh, I'm, I'm saying my son Bibby and I go okay. I I got a picture in my mind, but I have no idea who that person is, and I can't find. And I have to I have to file it to a file. I, you can't file a medical file without a name. It's illegal in the United States. If, a, if you have a chart and a page falls on the ground and the, and the page doesn't have the patient's name on that page, we're required to shred it. I listen. Okay. I listen. I will pass the information to the parents. Promise. Identity, just the first thing like last name. Simple. So um, you know, a birthday would be a birthday helpful. helps because sometimes you get Joe Smith. Similar. You got Joe Smith. You can have six Joe Smiths. You know. Um, I I just have to say that um, in terms of after care for therapy, I I would I'm going to be talking to Dr. Rieger and Rob and Dr. Nuzzo about 
maybe starting up something for some kind of rehab program afterwards. But I think that what's so great about Amy Cimento and and about my work is that it's based on neuro movement, Feldenkrais movement, and not Banyel method. And it's so gentle and so loving and not forceful. And I know that Dr. Nozo wants the kids up and 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 we do too. And and we do that and it might take a few more days, but the thing, it's like do no harm. And we don't want to just do what regular PT does with kids of get me up. I don't care how much pain you're in. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care that you can't get into state. I don't care about anything. You're going to get straight and move like a robot. And that's not how we that's not how we work. It's all about transitions. It's about being able to roll, being able to come up to sit on your own, being able to get into quadruped, being able to side sit, being able to get off the table, being able to shift your weight in a way that that works for you as opposed I've seen some post um, therapy in other places and I don't want to say where but I get that they want the kids straight and up and they just force them and and we've experienced that kids do better when you have much more subtlety and 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 generosity and let them connect let their brain get some synapses because they've never mm-hmm. done and so amy's a wonderful practitioner and she's wonderful with kids and she's very close to summit she's a nutley and um and i'm not available all the time I, you know a few days a week i work in a clinic um upstate new york so the two of us have been sharing kids and it's been a lovely collaboration and I'm more the medical person because I've been a PT for so long, but she's also wonderful. So I just wanted to introduce Amy Salento. Thank you. Amy, let's hear from you. Thank you. Yeah, nice to, sure, I'm happy to say a few things. So what I, what I would like to say, and of course, as Nancy pointed out, um, we do collaborate. So we work together for the benefit of the child. And also, you know, we know that this is such a huge undertaking for people, especially who've had to travel to the United States. So we do our best to fit it all together and make it work based on, you know, um, Nancy, as she said, she does work upstate a few days a week. But um, I wanted to say, and Dr. Nuzzo, thank you so much for saying the problem, the problems are coordination, timing, conservation of energy, because that's a big part of an op and yell method, neuro movement. We're doing that with adults who have patterns of movement that are causing them to not have good balance or not have good um, secure movements. And, and they're wasting a lot of energy. And especially as people age, that's a, that's a difficulty. So we're working on all ends of the spectrum, children and adults and the children who've had SPML, many of those children are using so much energy as Nancy pointed out, they've had therapies that have required efforting. And this is designed to not cause efforting. As Nancy said, they need the new neural pathways. Thank you, Dr. Nuzzo for explaining about, you know, the brain is still developing, the nervous system is still developing. And I look at this, I look at um, SPML as a small hinge swinging a big door. It's like, if you can do these, tiny, I don't want to call them tiny as if they're, you know, they're not important, but you can be very targeted and give uh, open a whole array of possibilities for for a child or even an adult. Um, It's so, um, it's almost miraculous, yet obviously we have this technique and thank you, Dr. Rieger for signing on to really um, learn this and carry, carry the mantle forward. Thank you very much. I just have one la- last question because I have from parents, I forget about it. The question it was about the SPML, but for hand. As wow. you know, for example, Dr. Bernius in Germany, he is doing a lot for hands. So when and why we are doing for hands and is it possible for hands and when it could work? Okay. Um, we. <laughs> I'm actually bent over backwards to not talk about hands. We do them. Because, um, you know, I was up to my, I'm up to here with the legs, you know. Um, <laughs> so when we have kids that, that we're going to be doing legs on and they got something going on in their hands, 
we'll say, okay, well, we're there anyway. 90% of the startup time is just to get the kid under anesthesia. So it's, you know, there's no loss of time to just do a little something here. In fact, our last kid, his hand looks great. Oh, the the pre-op and post-op just looks unbelievably good. And it's amazing. We both did, in fact, we doubled up on that one. Uh, uh, and I have to say, between the two of us, we got a piano player on our hands. Yeah. Um, Literally, he wanted to play piano. Yeah, no. The first thing he went like this. He was in recovery room, practicing, was like practicing full of the air. And um, the, the, the problem with arms is that um, hands are sensory organs primarily. Okay. And in a lot of the, a lot of the disorders that affect the arm, which is stroke, you know, it's not, it's not the PVL thing, you know, it's stroke can involve large segments of sens sensibility. And the outcome of use is very reliant on sensibility. So we can put all the motor stuff in there you want, but whether the person uses it functionally is going to come down to whether they have tactile sense. If you ever woke up uh, with your arm asleep, you see how useless it is. You can't feel it, even though the muscles work. Um, so sensibility is, is, is the limiting factor. It's the thing that we measure the poorest. So going in, I just trust the parents. I, I tell them, reach into a bag and see if the kid can tell something like a block from a ball. That's a big thing. Uh, you know, a nickel from a dime, an emery board from a popsicle stick. You know, you make it as uh, tough as you want. But the, as their skills go up with sensibility, spontaneous use goes up. But the hand, when it, when it comes down to it, is a precision instrument. And we can only give it one of three things, grasp, release, or delivery. Now, sometimes you'll see the wrist is down. So the, 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 the delivery is involved in getting the hand out of the way so, you know, so that the fingers can actually work. Uh, so sometimes it's just a small thing that can allow other things that would, would have worked if they weren't in such a bad position to work. Um, so those small things we'll just do as part of the leg procedure because it's, I, I always feel bad if somebody's gonna travel a long distance, go under an anesthesia, spend a lot of money just getting to and from, and then we do a hand and when it's done, it, it has better flexibility as far as manual exam goes, but they don't use it any different. And and that's that's, that's been my hang up on hands. Uh, I don't like to make pro functional promises because um, I can't put sensibility in there. I, I still, I, it's just something I can't do. Okay, understand. Thank you. Thank you. Understood. Understood. Thank you very much. It was my last question. I asked all the questions from the parents and I think it was all explained. If somebody wants to tell something else to, to finish the, the discussion, welcome. No, just that we're always open if there's any questions uh, to just ask and we're available and happy to look at patients. And uh, to uh, your point there, Nancy, we are uh, putting together something a little bit with the pre-op, post-op uh, instructions. And, and then we'd like to put a PT protocol on that too. So because we see people from all over the world and when they go out, unfortunately, we don't have people taking care of patients like you guys. So uh, it gives them a little guideline uh, of what to do a little bit more specifically. So we'll be reaching out to you. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, I, I wanted to say that um, the other day I had a child. I think this is a great story. And this is for everybody. Um, after SPML, a lot of the kids are sniveling. Ah, mommy, dad. So on day three or four um, to the eight-year-olds, seven-year-olds, I say to them, listen, I, I really need help. I really need help on kids who've had this procedure. They don't know what to do and they don't know how to walk. So I need you to be the spokesperson and start a YouTube channel. So can you help me with that? And mommy and daddy are going to take a video. And they go from being sniveling idiots to being, <laughs> they start standing up straight. Oh, Super well. Star. <laughs> Movie stars. And it's like miraculous. So, it, you know, it's Amy and I both do a lot of game playing because it's about make believe and about having fun. We had another kid who was into chess. <laughs> I got a gigantic chess game from Amazon. And I said, if you want to play chess, you've got to get on the floor, move the chess pieces. And that's the only way you can play right now for the next few weeks. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that's a good way as opposed to get in the walker now walk now you've got to do 10 steps because that's not how kids think so you have to start like Amy does too you have to think like a kid right. yeah. 
Yeah, and bring in the curiosity and the creativity and enthusiasm. And I just want to make a comment on sensibility and sensation. You know, a big part of an up and yell method is really tapping in and working with the child on the feeling, the feeling, the sensation, the sensibility that's going to create new neural pathways. And then the other thing I want to say is we have this advantage of Zoom, whichever you want. You want to use um, Zoom, Google Meet. Uh, FaceTime, you know, parents can have, bring their children for some work with Nancy and me. And then when they go home, we can, we can coach them at home. I mean, that's a possibility as well, because a child has been living their life at home and the parents in many times have been accommodating what the child can or can't do. And they go back home and it's sort of like, wait, how do we, how do we revise how we're functioning at home? And, and ABM has the nine essentials. You don't need a hands-on therapist. You can have us, you know, online. So I just want to say that that's available as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Um, and I will send the Zoom to you because I will make a link and uh, to, I will post it on the uh, YouTube and all the uh, all the other uh, social medias. And I will share it with the parents. And I will be yeah. happy to have news from you, any anything new you're doing or new doctors who is doing operation in other locations, just let me know. Okay. You got it. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time and putting this together. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Rob, Happy to holiday. organize everything. Thank you. Be well. Okay.